Okay, great. Well, without further ado, um, we have Alex Wade from Wade Environment with us now talking about the IPM farm. So, Alex, show yourself, please. Oh, hang on. I thought, Can I hear you? <laughs> yeah, I thought you guys did that, right? I've I've shown myself. Am I there? There I you go. There you are. Hi, everyone. Are. I'll let That's... you do your introductions, Alex. I'll leave you to it. Hi, guys. Well, uh, don't be alarmed. I'm not actually sat in the field on the farm. Wonders of modern technology. But I am going to start sharing my screen now so we can have a look and again have a talk through the IPM farm. So the IPM farm was actually, um, I love the name, but I have to give all credit to Scott for coming up with this name after a conversation we were having around what we were doing down on um, a site, a farm that I use as a sandbox. So today I'm going to go through the IPM farm. I'm going to talk to you guys what it is that we do down there, how we can make it work for you, and also how you guys can, can help us in some respects as well. But first things first, for those who know me, you know me, and for those who don't, my name is Alex Wade. I am the director of Wade Environmental. Um, for many years, I used to work as the technical manager for Pelgar International. Um, and in my spare time, I, you know, don't just deal with pests, but I also keep all kinds of other weird and wonderful beasties as a, as a little bit of a side note. Um, but I think probably the most important thing to remember by far is I, I don't take life too seriously. I like to have a bit of fun. Uh, and I believe education through you know, learning and being practical and having a good time is, is much more important than whiteboards and learning things by rote. So hopefully we can do a little bit of all of that today. So first things first, this is the farm. This is the IPM farm. And it's a wonderful place. It's based out in uh, an arable farm on a country estate out in Basingstoke. Um, and it's active all year round. And I'm going to show you some aerial photographs in a bit, but it is um, surrounded on all sides with large fields of crops. And just down the road as well, they keep a lot of livestock. So there's a little bit of everything. All of the challenges you might want from a rodent infestation are present here. Now, the purpose of my being on the farm and my documenting my life there and me taking pictures and using them in talks um, is not uh, to basically take a picture of something to you know reinforce a philosophy. It's not an I told you so event. It's not us sitting here saying, ah, we've caught you out. This is absolutely the way to do it, you know, and there's no other. No, the purpose of the farm is that it's a sandbox where everyone can come and learn. We can discuss new techniques. We can look at how to do things. We can, you know, empirically measure how best to do things. And we can take those existing techniques, we can take those existing tools and strategies, and we can hone them as well. We can find what works, we can knock the rough edges off them. And most importantly, it's a place where we can road test new products. And I say in an objective way rather than a subjective way, because we, we all do road tests, we will all test um, products when we are buying them for the first time. But the problem with that is, is that can be quite subjective. Um, words such as I like this one more than that one. I like um, um, you know, I, it, rather subjective, it's based on emotion. The purpose of having a farm, which we use time and time again, is the fact that it is objective. We can put metrics by it. We can put numbers to that as opposed to emotions. So that's probably the biggest part of the IPM farm is it's a sandbox and it allows us to work with this. So here we go. Here's the site from above. And when I said it was surrounded by fields, it really is. It's a little island in the middle of nowhere, isn't it? It's absolutely beautiful. It's absolutely wonderful. But first off, let's talk some start, uh, bits on the site. So number one, I mean, quickly on the chat, when I move my cursor around, can people see the cursor moving? Um, yeah, or... we can see that. Hey, excellent stuff. So I also tend to wander with the cursor quite a bit as well. So if it's been giving people, um, you know, seizures, I apologize. But very quickly, let's talk about the site. Now, the site is amazing. And the, the buildings itself, the architecture are quite something. So for starters, this building here was the original building. And it is used now as this back half as a, a workshop and this front half as a grain silo where the grain gets dumped onto the floor over um, grids in, in a bin fashion. But before it was either of those two things, it was an aircraft hangar. And you can probably, you know, when you're stood there, you can actually see very clearly, but you can see that the airstrip used to come down here and it was for light aircraft. It was actually for Lord uh, Cadbury of Cadbury Milk Chocolate. And he used to fly his plane in and landed up here and stay in the, the stately manor just down at the bottom there. 
Um, now, over years, it, it got bought by uh, Lord Sainsbury's, now sadly the, the late Lord Sainsbury's. And he turned it, you know, he started to use it as a farm and we started to build more and more bits on. And the reason I'm going through this is because it is a wonderful exercise in the evolution of how um, industry or, you know, agriculture has gone. So this this building here, the, the very the very first one is just to all intents and purposes, it's a shell with a whole load of drying grates in the floor where the grain just gets dumped straight onto the floor. As you can imagine, from a pest control point of view, that can be a challenge. This one here, this one here, uh, is a bit different. So on the inside of this building, it's all honeycombed. It's a, a whole load of silos on the inside, and they go up two stories, and the, the cereal and the feed gets dropped in from above. But then it gets dropped through the floor onto a series of um, tr conveyor belts, tractors, pulleys, buckets, everything you'd like. And it gets moved up and shuffled around and it can go through a blower, dryer, grader, all of these things. Um, and that in itself, another fantastic and wonderful challenge because the rodents can and, and do and had in the past got into these conveyor belts, uh, were living on the inside of them because they were run maybe two or three times a season just to make sure that stuff was put away and then stored for many, many months. It actually provided, um, let's say, an assault course for rodents. They absolutely loved it. Then the next little bit, as you can see tacked onto the back of this, is the, stand, you know, the, the, the classical silo shape, these great big uh, cylindrical tubes at the back. Uh, and these are very secure um, up until the point that they're not, and they become a huge problem. But they are filled from the top and emptied from the bottom. And they are basically just huge, great big cans filled with different cereals. And then finally, we have this building here, which was built in 2015. And this is like Fort Knox. It's amazing. Uh, the concrete goes two or three feet below the floor. Um, it's concrete all the way up to about 10 feet up the side of the walls. There is no penetrations going around. And if there are, they are heavily masticked in place. And yet we still find rodents finding their way in. Because uh, as you know, things like mice, any gap of less than six millimeters, anything you'd stick your little finger into, they'll get into. Uh, and of course, trying to make a building that size to have absolutely <laughs> yeah, it's zero gaps, less than six millimeters, you'd make it hermetic, you, you'd turn it into a vacuum in there. So this is the site. And this is what affords us this wonderful sandbox, because there is a little bit of everything. And it's analogous to pretty much anywhere else on the planet, bar maybe a fish and chip shop. So we're able to, to hone our skills down here. But not only that, we have the pests coming in from all sides. So this field here um, it is crop. This is crop. This is hay for haylage. This is kept for livestock for grazing. And all of this down here is vineyard. And this is orchard. So we, <laughs> we have every little scurrying fuzzy bugger knocking at our doorstep. And as such, it's it's a, a case of constant, constant recruitment, which is interesting because at that point, um, it allows for some very interesting experiments, not just necessarily um, from the tools that we use and how we kill them, but sort of like looking at how quickly sites can get reinfested, what tools for prevention work best, um, what tools for you know expulsion and proofing can we work with here. So it, it's, a, as I say, it's a wonderful little sandbox and it's an absolutely beautiful place. So there we go. Um, this is having a look, this is the haylage field. And you can see just that back here, I've got a couple of my own beehives going. Um, names, uh, if you could in the chat for what I should probably call my beehives. The best so far is I should call it Beyonce, um, but I honestly, I want a better name than that. So if you can think of anything better than do, do let me know. But you can see here, these fields that are used for haylage, um, the grass is long, um, the grass is long, it heaps over. And in fact, if you were to take more than five minutes out of your day, you would find that actually a lot of these little um, hillocks and a lot of these um, bits where you've got refugia covering over will have field mice, bank voles, field voles, littering them in abundance. And that of course presents another real challenge to this site is not just the pests, but the non-targets as well. So all through the site, we have a series of cameras set up uh, and with these, we move them around. So we have um, these near link cameras, which are absolutely fantastic. You can dial into them by remote. I get uh, notifications on my phone when interesting things happening. But we also use a range of your classic um, motion activated cameras as well, as well as using things like sand trays. We can track footprints, um, tracking dust, a whole load of things we can actually utilize in order to um, measure and see who's doing what, when, and at all times. So the locations, these, as I say, get 
um, move about frequently. And we do actually move them quite far out into the fields as well, just to see um, the animals, you know, what diversity of animals there are further away from the farm, because that's a big thing, because we, we need to see if it's moving in or whether or not we are having a significant impact. Uh, and to look for signs primarily of rodent activity, but also we find all kinds of other, other animals here. So this is this is a weasel, um, as you can see, it's a little um, black tip of its tail and the fact that it is probably about the size of a Cumberland sausage. Um, and this constant intrusion of wildlife, um, as well as persistent pests, makes the IPM farm a, a fantastic challenge. Uh, and especially when you have a look from the point of view of, you know, the press releases of crew, this is probably one of the places where we have the biggest interaction between human beings and our interests and the wildlife that we're trying to protect. So ideally, if we can get it right here, then we can get it right anywhere. And that's that's the hope of the IPM farm. So we also, and just here we go, we have some, some visitors and some of them don't stay very long at all. That, that blur of motion running up and down the path, sorry, I absolutely love that video. Um, that's a hare. Um, and we, we, weirdly enough, we don't have any foxes on this site, but we do have a lot of hares and we do have a lot of buzzards uh, and they are constantly setting off the cameras. Uh, and as you can see here, this video isn't sped up. These guys just genuinely are <laughs> greased lightning. They're incredible animals. Um, but all of this, you know, the weasels, the hares, um, the birds of prey are all indicative of a very healthy ecosystem. And so that's what we want to try and uh, keep and commit to and um, make sure that we don't damage by what we do. Um, and it means that we have to have a good and hard look, not just about how we control rodents. Um, sorry, it's, it means we need to have a look at how we control rodents, not just a case of what we're using to control rodents. We, we can use, and we do use down on this site, uh, the full range, you know, a, a full range going from FGARs, SGARs to calciferols. Um, but it's the way in which we use them that actually allows us to preserve the wildlife and to preserve these, these animals. Um, so it's, it's not just a case of what, but it's a case of how, it's a case of when, and it's a case of where. And we'll, we'll have a look at some of those in just a bit, because it is possible to do. We have been doing it. Um, so some of the non-target risks, as I said before, fields, we've got deer, we have got um, hares, weasels, we have a lot of buzzards, kites, barn owls and kestrels, which is absolutely glorious. Um, but this is, you know, as you might imagine, um, I've spoken Lord Sainsbury's, Lord Cadbury, all of these uh, lords and ladies, this is a country estate. And as such, we have uh, a lot of things like ground nesting birds, we have pheasants and partridges as well. And I don't know if anyone has had the joy of working with pheasants, more colloquially known as suicide birds. They will try and get into anything. They will just put themselves in harm's way at the drop of a hat. And so when it comes to sort of like testing boxes, for example, it's just how well they can um, survive assault by non-target animals. Um, pheasants are a good measure of that. They will, they will try their level best to cause as many problems as they can. And of course, I mentioned before, we have these, and this is how we know we're doing things right down on, down on the farm, because both of these came from last year. And we've been undergoing, we've been doing the, um, you know, assisting with the pest control down there for many, many years, but we've only been taking it on fully um, over the last year of Wade Environmental. And over the last year, we have had uh, these guys. So this is a fledge of kestrels, absolutely gorgeous. Now, when I first saw these, I mean, the interesting thing about kestrels is they don't make their own nests. They are nests, so they will steal the old nests of other birds, or they will find outcrops or ledges or bowls of trees. So they end up making the most precarious nests you like. There was four eggs in here, and there's four, four kestrels fledged. And the eggs spent weeks while, they, <laughs> while we were waiting for them to hatch, like teetering on the edge of this. I walk past every morning, like... Heart in heart of my mouth, thinking this is this is going to go. They go. This is going to be the day that I find one on the floor like an omelette. But no, apparently that's what they do. They are evolutionarily designed to to nest in precarious places. And of course, this guy. Uh, and this was the second lot of barn owls in a single year. So um, he was very late in the year. He was a little underweight due to the fact that there was less. Um, you know, just it was cold and there wasn't as much food around in the outskirts of the field. But certainly having these guys and having, you know, not just one, but technically three clutches of birds of prey actually on the site um, was 
was good. It's a it's a good indication that we are not having a a negative impact out there. Um, so good. But not only that, the the pellets. So bird of prey pellets. They allow us to do something very very special. They allow us to do something quite interesting. And that's we can take these pellets, and we can then. It's, it's not a fun job. I'm going to be honest with you. It's a bit grotty, but we can pull them apart. You can prise them into all these different bits. And then you can find the skulls. Uh, specifically, you find the upper skull and you count how many molars it has. And you see how big it is and a whole load of other um, metrics. And with that, we can figure out the diversity of the animals on site, the non-targets on site. And what we found um, from the prey animals found within the barn owl pallets from the first route, so the first half of 2020, where are we, 2021? Um, I don't know, COVID is, is just the first half of the COVID years, um, meant that this is what we were finding. You know, we can see here that the predominantly most of the animals predated by barn owls are wood mice. There were some field voles, but it was mostly bank voles as well. It's few shrews. Now, the interesting thing is almost no brown rats, almost no house mice. Um, and this is interesting considering that there definitely were brown rats on site. There weren't house mice as far as I could find, but there definitely were brown rats on site. But you can see how actually how little um, of a uh, barn owl's diet is comprised of the species that we are looking to control. And so the question you have to ask yourself, therefore, is, is how are we getting this seepage? How are we getting this um, backdraft of first and second generation anticoagulants into, you know, into detectable levels within barn owls? Um, if, if barn owls are, are not, you know, the, the majority of their prey um, by, not by volume, but by, um, uh, frequency is is these animals, which we absolutely, absolutely should not be controlling with with chemical means. Uh, and it's also quite interesting to see. So this was this is it, it does follow on from a study done out in New Jersey, which found that um, these were the weight classes of uh, rats found within barn owl pellets, and these were the weight classes of the rats actually found on the farm. And you can see there is a cutoff, a very clear cutoff, around about here. You know, as soon as you get to that one ninety. The numbers shoot up, probably, <laughs> assumedly so, because they're not being eaten by barn owls anymore. But it means that actually of, of Norway rats, of which you're looking at about 300 grams to be the average for an adult um, rat, you know, the only chance that they are really susceptible is in that relatively narrow window, a relatively short window, while they are juveniles. And at that point, they're not really going to be moving that far away from home. They're going to be scavenging quite close to it. So you can see, therefore, that... Um, there is this uh, disparity between what barn owls eat and what is, of course, getting um, picked up on what's being left on site. And so this does then raise a lot of questions as to what should we be doing and how can we do it better to make sure that these residues are not moving further back down into the line. And as I said before, here we go. This is some of the refugia that we found on site. We lifted it up. You can see, here we go, all of these very, very clear subsurface tunnels. And so what we did is we put a big tire baiter down with a little camera inside it. Um, and there we go. You can see little voles. And the amazing thing was, is this was not far. It was not far away from active, you know, and I picked up on other cameras, active rat burrows. So we had active rat burrows and then, you know, within a stone's throw, literally and figuratively, we had a healthy population of voles growing. So that is, you know, interesting, also a little alarming, a bit, bit, bit concerning. So we need to be able to, you know, when we do our environmental risk assessments, um, just because we've found, you know, a healthy and average population of rats, we shouldn't discount the fact that there aren't other animals in that area as well. Now, this was... This is a test I started to do out of interest, and it's a bit gross, but hear me out. There is a reason to it. I shot some rats. You know, a part of, part of the integrated pest management strategy is to try everything. You know, so we, we were out there. We did some rat shoots. Um, I shot some rats. And out of interest, because there are a lot of kites, I took a camera and I put um, one of the dead rats out on a pedestal, carrion, and I went to go and have a look to see how long it took a... But a, a, a kite or a scavenging animal to swoop in and pick this up because I wanted to know in reality, you know, if you were to go tomorrow and you were to bait a site and on day three, we started to have rodents dropping, but you didn't come back to day five um, and you found no carcasses. Is that because the animals have died in their burrows or have they died above ground and they've instantly been snaffled up by something? And the weird thing was, was actually um, 
it didn't get picked up for quite some time, which was, you know, maybe I put it in the wrong place. Maybe I, you know, didn't put it in good sight. You know, maybe I put a, a brown rat on a brown log and that <laughs> not enough contrast. But the alarming thing was, is I left it there for a week and nothing touched it. It was there for a week, but over winter, it didn't, you know, it was cold. It didn't decompose. It was like a little freezer. And so that rat actually stayed out there in the open, um, a, available to scavengers for a very long time. It wasn't decomposed by your usual insect critters who would, you know, over the summer in a matter of days, turn that to a, a sack of jelly and, and the rest of it. So I started to do such things as decomp tests as well. So we have a, a large section of woodland down the back. And within that, we took those rats. And you can see that this is these rats. And I took this picture um, on Monday. You can see in this, these temperatures at the moment, they don't decompose. You know, they'll sit there, they'll bloat, they'll look a bit sad, obviously, but they're not breaking down. And these buckets have holes drilled all the way through them to allow all of the um, insects in. Now, I'm sure as I continue this experiment over the year and the, the, you know, the closer we get to spring and summer, when of course these um, temperatures start to build up and we start to get more Lucilia, Califoride, uh, these other carrion flies, this period will drop to you know days at that point for, for carrion to get destroyed. But of course, at the moment, um, they're not. And, and again, so this does, this is a, a real concern because it means that carrion is available longer for access to carrion feeding animals. Um, so something to think about. Now, the other thing is as well is um, when we're down on site, so a bit of a segue, but we can get such wonderful photos as this. So when we are, you know, successful in moving rodents out of the farm, um, you know, when they move in in these small populations, um, you know, we will find a burrow. And the amazing thing is you can see quite clearly here that as this burrow, as the number of animals has decreased in the burrow, the maintenance of the burrow edges has gone down and down and down. So on each sub subsequent visit, you know, you can see here that they're making a relatively good job of keeping it clear here. Not so much because probably the burrow is not being used so much. And at this point, when everything's dead, there's nobody to clear out these holes and it very quickly backfills with detritus. So we're able to take these little observational metrics as well, which help feed back into our training because um, these, uh, these allow us to sort of say, Right. Well, th these are things you've got to look for when you are looking for a declining population as opposed to a migrating population. And of course, here we go. We've got the cameras overlooking the ground. So this is this is within that hangar that I mentioned before. And you can see, of course, it is it's just a door with a walkway running over the top. And there are hundreds of tons of grain in there. It's, it's you know, it's a real challenge for pest controllers. Anyone who and I know there's a lot of you out there who do pest control rurally. It, it's a real hoot to try and keep these places safe and secure and free of rodents. Um, and it's the ultimate reason that we are on that farm is to control the rodents. We don't allow them to build up. We don't just sit there and rub our hands together and be like, yes, come to me and my four small, you know, fuzzy minions, uh, run riot because I'm going to try out this brand new thing. No, um, the idea is, is to, you know, first we test the exclusion, then we test the proofing, then we test the other bits and bobs as well. So there we go. And the impact pests have on the food chain, it, it, you can feel it in every link from field to fork. And you can see here, I mean, um, keep your eyes out later. I'm in the process of writing an article about how to make a pancake. And if you think about making a pancake, thinking about every step along the line of that pancake coming from your field to ending up on your plate, you guys have a very real impact on how it gets to us. You have an impact on how it gets stored safely. You have an impact on how it gets um, you know, protected from pests in the food factories, how it gets protected from pests in the distribution network, in the distribute, you know, and in, in the shops as well. And then when it gets to people's homes as well, you are involved every length of the, every step of the way. And so this is, this is why this place is so important to make sure that these strategies um, work so well. And also we can have a look at the hardware as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of um, projects we worked on, but the pictures I'm using will have nothing to do with them. I'm going to use no names and I'm going to give no results, but I will talk about the projects as well because some of them are very, very interesting. Uh, and so some of the things we do, we, we test a range of um, hardware. So we've been asked before to test things like bait boxes and new product designs. And you can see here, uh, and this was some existing boxes. So this was a proof of concept trial that we did some time ago. You can see when you put boxes down, we're able, because we are under a lens, to have a look at this and say, right, well, rats are running over the top. And they would run up and over the top um, for several days before they even deigned to even have that the slightest of movement through. But as soon as they came in, you know, it was only a matter of, you know, at that point, days as opposed to a week or so, where suddenly 
it was accepted and they were fine and we were seeing a, a tremendous amount of activity. So being able to observe neophobia in its facets, in each of its stages, um, was an absolutely fascinating thing to do. We of course will test um, some products as well down there, which is a real hoot that so we can field test products. Um, we can do this for regulatory purposes, which can be a slog, but is really, really interesting. Or we simply do a lot of these tests for screening or marketing purposes as well. And you can see some work really well uh, and some less so, but there we go. Um, we also do this thing called, um, and we'll see this more and more, uh, product road test. The idea is, is we're going to start taking products and we're going to start doing a five point product road test. We'll look at the environmental durability, uh, damage done by non-targets, palatability, handleability and user interaction and the use pattern comprehension. And then at that point, we'll be able to give it uh, a ranking. But we, we the, uh, the aim of Wade Environmental is to try and make it a bit more transparent. Uh, the, you know, the different products, how they compare to one another, and not just how they compare to one another in their ideal situations, um, because that would be like comparing apples and oranges. Um, so what we're trying to do is to compare apples and oranges against a known third variable. In this case, grain, in my analogy, pears. But at that point, it allows for a level playing field, and you can test everything equally at that point. We also have a wonderful range of so we, we have little labs down on site. So we have uh, we've we've annexed a little bit of the site. We've turned it into some labs, and we we breed a range of different insects. Uh, so we have some you know a whole load of um, oriental cockroaches here. I'm sorry that some of them are not in focus, but if you've ever tried to take a picture of a tub of oriental cockroaches and get them all to stay still at the same time, then you are a better um, person than I am for sure. So we culture a range of insects and we use these to observe behavior because their behaviors change as they grow uh, and they do different things and they need different things at different stages of their life, especially those that go through a complete metamorphosis. Um, and this allows us then again to test a range of hardware formulations and presentations in an objective way as opposed to a subjective way. We can actually put numbers um, to these um, you know, thoughts and feelings as well. And, you know, we've been able to undertake tests on things like UAV fly machines because we breed a lot of flies. And, uh, you know, here we go. Nice musca domestica back in here. And by using animals from the lab that we've cultured ourselves, it means we have a known history for them. Um, we know that they are, you know, their behavior is not going to be motivated by the fact that they wanted to go and lay eggs because we use them when they're only a day or so old or a couple of days old and they have no um, drive yet to, to go and find food to go and lay eggs on. Or we find animals that have been well fed, um, they've got everything they need, so they're not undergoing foraging behavior. So we're able to look for the behaviors that are going to drive them best. And so we're able to control those variables by using animals from, from the lab at that point. And so tests like this, so this is one of the tests we did, and we did do a load of tests on a load of different ULV machines. And what we're able to do is we're to take um, a large arena. It was actually a, um, a 20 foot shipping container, which was hermetically sealed on all sides. We had um, a, a fly screen and a fly screen just behind it here. So when you moved in and out, you didn't actually you know, drag flies in or drag flies out with you. Uh, and we had a control unit at one side, which was literally just a fluorescent light, which had no UV output. And then we put the test unit on this side. And then in the middle, we released 50 house flies and 50 um, blow flies into the middle. And over the course of 24 hours, we saw how quickly it took them to get attracted or not attracted to this unit. You know, were they just 50-50? Were they just as interested in a fluorescent tube as they were interested in um, the ULV, not ULV, sorry, the UV fly machine. Um, how quickly did it happen? How, what percentage of control? So these are the kind of things we can do to actually put some objective numbers to um, a relatively subjective um, outcome. So how we can make this work for you? Weight environmental. We can, you know, we can take all of this knowledge that we have um, learned from the farm, that we learned from the field, and we can you know, we, we, we drop it into training. We can have people turn up to the farm to do practical hands-on training, or we can do training online or through classrooms or through third parties. So we can bring it to you. As I said before, a lot of what we do is looking at um, road testing, product testing, lab testing, and this can be done screening, marketing, or, or through, um, you know, uh, regulatory purposes. Uh, and then we can take that information and bring it to you. Site evaluations, root cause analysis, uh, gap analysis, all of these things. But it's not just that. And if, sorry, if you want to get in contact with me, you see this little barcode's been at the side down here all, all the session. If you hold your phone up to that, it'll bring up uh, a contact page. So at that point, you're able to just book a contact with me, have a chat to me, and that should be absolutely fine. But you can actually help us as well as, as, an, um, as not just an industry, but as, as a company as well. Engage. 
talk to us. Let us know what it is that you guys are thinking. Because at the end of the day, we are here, we, Wade Environmental, are here to try and drive um, good practice, good behavior. We're trying to find new products. We're trying to look for um, the best way of doing things to have the maximum impact with the minimum cost. Okay. Uh, and to do that, we need to know what is, what's tickling your fancy. So we need to know what it is that is driving you guys. So engage, talk to us. Um, I'm never going to say no to a conversation. You can help us find suitable sites for the road tests and field tests. You know, we're based predominantly down the south, but occasionally we need to move all around. Um, this is one I absolutely love. When we have tests in, let's say, for, for silverfish, one of the hardest things to do when you are trying to test a new sticky trap for silverfish is to find a healthy running population of silverfish. And that's why we keep so many animals in the lab, so we can do these screening studies first. So if you ever come across something interesting, you know, just bundle of pharaoh ants, uh, a whole load of uh, arisophilus, you know, some, some insects. Love it if you just dropped us a line because at worst, I'll come out with a little pooter running down the road. <laughs> and at best, I might ask you to put some into a bag uh, as a thank you. And once again, engage with us. That would be absolutely fantastic. Not just with us, with the trade associations, with the industry. And, you know, we're under so much pressure as an industry at the moment. You only have to have a look at how the glue board's going, uh, the ECHA um, consultations. Um, there was a third one that came out the other day that I was hopping about. Yeah, the, the changes in bait boxes. Um, you know, it's all happening. And we as an industry need to have a united front. We need to all stand together. We need to talk to one another. We need to talk to our trade associations, let them know what it is that we want so we can, you know, make sure that our industry is placed in the best place it can be over the next couple of years. So that is me done. Nat, are you there? I haven't looked at the time. I don't know if I've got wildly under, wildly over. I haven't been pulled off with a shepherd's crook yet. So <laughs> I'm, I'm here now. You're absolutely perfect on time um, with that, Alex. And I'll probably perfect. speak for everybody here, but most of the way through that, I was like this, you know, I'm going to listen and watch it. It's, it's so interesting. And um, I guarantee everybody else has the same uh, sentiment. We've got a few questions as well. I'll um, pop them out to you. So a um, bit of a question about your trial cameras um, and what specs you look at. So where did you get the trial, trial cameras from and what specs should they look for? Okay, so there's a couple of specs you need to have a look for. You might need to do a little bit of digging, but there's a couple of things. So um, like, so oh, trying to think of the words. Um, not shutter speed, but the rate of reaction of the camera can be quite important. So some of the CCTV cameras um, you get, um, they're looking for human beings, they're looking for relatively large objects. And so their rate of reaction and their fidelity um, may not be as high as you need. You know, we're looking for little scurrying for small things. So um, through some trial and error and through talking to others who have done it, the real ink cameras are the ones that we use. Um, they're very good. You can set the actual um, sensitivity very, very high, which means that looking for rodents, they can be very, very good. Uh, it does mean that, you know, sometimes flakes of dust, um, strong winds, that one blade of grass doing this, will <laughs> have your phone constantly going off. But other than that, they are very good cameras. So you're wanting to have a look at the sensitivity, you're wanting to have a look at um, the pickup at speed as well. Um, it's nice to have a camera that will link to the internet uh, that will link to your phone. Uh, it's not necessary, um, but it, it does make it a little bit more active and dynamic, but it does put the cost through the roof, I mean, mm -hmm. at that point. So I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we've got a suggestion from Martin here about your um, your aviary. Well, how about Alec, uh, Alex's apiary? <laughs> I like that, Alex's apiary. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the only one I can contender. see in those thoughts at the moment. With the chat section, you can have a little scroll through there, and maybe oh, there's some more suggestions. Uh, I absolutely will. That'd be fantastic. Good stuff. Um, so Paul here says, it "Looks like an ideal place for foxes. Why aren't they? Why are they absent? Anything?" I I absolutely don't know. And I I've moved the cameras all around, and I can't seem to to see them. Um, we don't have an on-site gamekeeper. You know, my my first thought was I went and spoke to the you know. Um, or not the lordlings, but you know the, the site managers. Do you have a gamekeeper that just comes around and um, traps the risk? No, no, no. It just it it's very strange. Either it's just a bubble, or there's something else going on that I'm just not quite aware of. There's a lot of bands of woodland, but there's not a huge amount of um, you know area which might. I, I just you know I just I don't know. And I'm moving the cameras around all the time because it's something that's vexing me as well. Because by all intents and purposes, um, the number of pheasants we have there, the number of um, hares we have running around, should you know it should support a relatively healthy population of foxes. Mm -hmm. um, I found 
one badger set right out in the boondocks. Nothing that's come particularly close as well. So large ground mammals seem to be, you know, not so not so common. Uh, we don't have the hunt that goes on around here. Um, we do have a lot of people walking dogs. So whether or not that's a, an exclusionary factor, I don't know. But that's never <laughs> never really affected foxes before. Mm -hmm. um, Keep in contact. Drop me a line. Um, you know, ask that question, and as soon as I find an answer to it, <laughs> I will let you know because it's it's been bothering me as much as, as anything else. I have to say. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Uh, animals they never they never seem to surprise us, do they? With the way they're behaving, it's uh, what keeps us interested. Um, so Dan Lake here says, do you have any re uh, any decomposition tests with the rat bodies in contact with the ground to allow microbes access? Uh, yeah, it is something that we're having a look at. It's just a case of being able to put together that arena um, in such a way that it is um, controllable. So first things first, we're just going to be doing doing it this way so we can get a nice base level. And then as soon as we have that base level over the year um, with decomposition rates over just temperature and access to insects, then we'll start redoing the tests um, as it starts to get colder with them in contact with, as you say, the ground to allow all of that um, microfauna that lives within the ground to move up and to do its thing that way. Uh, and it's been quite clearly shown that things like carrion beetles will start to, they will start to um, drag animals underground, you start to find them moving down and down and down. So actually, yes, in contact with the floor, things will get buried a lot faster by, by animals as well. So yes, it will be part of the ongoing process, but the idea of any uh, objective study is to take one variable at a time, measure it and measure it and measure it. So there we go. Right, is, is your lab separate to your home or is that within your home? It's an interesting <laughs> space if it is. <laughs> For a very small period of time while I was setting up, the two were the same environment. Um, and my partner, bless her, um, was very accommodating to have just tubs of cockroaches everywhere. The, the tubs of cockroaches we have, there's about 10,000 cockroaches per one of these 200 litre bins. And so you open the window, you turn the lights on in the morning and they're all like, and they will just <laughs> and they will scurry around. So first thing in the morning when you wake up to make a coffee, you can just hear this chittering behind you like, oh. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the need. cockroaches. That's the cockroaches. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure many of us watching today find that pretty interesting. We would be pleased with that, but many, many not. Um, so a question here from Anonymous. Um, so regarding the IPM farm, this is a wildlife rich area with many non-targets. How would you justify the use of an FGAR, SGAR in that environment with so the availability the of calcifor? So that's the point. Um, it's all down to your justification. It's all down to the, um, the the way in which you use it, how you use it. Now, of course, with the amount of wildlife there, the justifications for using an FGRSGAR become, you know, vanishingly small at that point. Um, they get used specifically for. So when I have environments, let's say, uh, rodents are starting to work their way into a building where there is a lot of... Um, um, store product. And of course, the, with the change in the regulations, you can't start to pay. It's very hard to get an animal out of a building which has got grain in because your options for control within that building that has um, grain in become very, very reduced. So you need to make sure that if they are pushing, you know, if they've pushed past those boundaries, you see, uh, I didn't put the picture in, but basically I have a three tiered system of controls ranging from exclusion and, you know, physical controls to things like calciferol in, in a, you know, bubble in the middle. And then in the very center where you know they've gone through the other three shells if they get there then we need to start having a look and we need to use a product at that point that um even a single feed or a very um what do you say uh, an exploratory feed is going to be sufficient in order to drop them now the thing you have to bear in mind at that point is um with the single feed second generations one to two grams is all is it all it needs. So putting a lot of it down in a lot of places and leaving it there for a long time, that's when you start to see problems because the animals will overeat. They will eat more than they need. They'll continue to eat up until the point that they die. So they might get 10, 20, 50 lethal doses into them before they succumb. That is when they become a real problem in terms of secondary poisoning. Now, if we were to utilize um, strategies such as pulse baiting uh, or, or, or micro baiting and be able to keep an eye on that. So very little in relatively large windows every five to seven days. At that point, the animal has as much as it needs to, to perish and no more. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, it means that at that point you have one or two lethal doses, not 50 to 70. And okay, there may be an impact to the environment, but you've justified that because you absolutely need to make sure that that product is 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 secure. Now, things like calciferol, yes, very, very good. But the problem is, is if they've not looked at it on the way in, I can't guarantee they're not going to look at it when they get right into the heart of the site. And at mm -hmm. that point as well, it takes something like, um, you know, it's 1.4 or 14 grams 14 grams for an adult rat or 1.4 for a mouse which is relatively large numbers you know that's mm -hmm. a multiple feed event and if i only have one chance to catch them on the way by it needs to make sure that it is that one chance that catches them i hope that makes sense it's it's all down to your justification with this at the end of the day mm -hmm. and the point of the ipm farm is not to shoehorn these things in is to be able to find the best solution for the best um environment mm -hmm. and it may be that it may not that's the point we have a look at then so there we go no, fantastic. Very uh, um, um, couldn't, uh, good, good answer there. I've got a couple of people asking about moles on the farm. Uh, yes, we do have some moles on the farm. We are, in fact, actually running a practical mole course through 1EMV later on in this year. Um, myself and uh, a couple of very, very good pest controllers who, who specialize in moles will be helping me put on a practical course where we'll be spending the morning having a look at the different types of traps, we'll be having the morning looking at different um, you know, application methods, and then we'll be spending the afternoon traipsing through a field, um, hopefully not being chased by cows, um, <laughs> you know, uh, deploying some mole traps and recovering some other mole traps that have been set the night before just to see how it works, recovering the trap, finding the trap. As I'm sure the guys that do moles uh, are aware, sometimes finding where you put them can be as challenging as putting them down themselves. So there we go. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I've got some a few people asking about your contact detail. I think Lauren's just put it into the chat section for everybody, um, your, your, your email, etc. They're asking you to share your penultimate screen again, but we've put your contact details in there for you, Alex. Thank um, you. And then one more question from Simon here. So um, trying to bait for rodents on a working farm can be very frustrating. <laughs> it's truly a question of being constantly flexible in bait use and locations, especially given the various wildlife uh, presence. Farm pest control can be extremely time consuming. So more of a, more of a comment rather than a question, but I think that's... But, uh I absolutely, absolutely agree, Simon. And yes, it is, uh, as I said before, and I've, I've, I've done a couple of articles on it, in my mind, it's the frontier between all of the things that we are constantly talking about it in crew, you know, the, the, these um, residues, the protection of non-target animals, uh, all of these, it, it is that very fine edge between those two. And I think pest controllers as an industry, you know, pest control should, um, we should take more of a, an interest in it. Because uh, unfortunately, at the moment, when it's left to those who maybe are not quite so educated or haven't been kept up to date with the latest um, hows, whats and whys, um, that's where the issues are going to occur. But you guys, you know, this is this is where we should be um, flying away with our skill and knowledge and expertise. Um, mm -hmm. And and yes, it's a challenge, but it's a, it's a it's a really good one. It's a really yeah. fun one. So we there we go. Challenge. Indeed, yeah, life's yeah. boring without a challenge, eh? Um, <laughs> great, well, fantastic. That perfect timing, Alex. As always, um, we're, <laughs> we're one minute away from from having the break. So again, thank you, and I know that's um, uh, echoed by everybody else. That was amazing and really interesting. Thank you, Alex. No worries. Thank you ever so much, guys. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye.